Hi guys, Dr. Gillard. Welcome to another lecture on spinal anatomy. It is the Wednesday lecture, week three. It is spring 2020. And here we go. I think, what is the date? I don't even know what the date is. Like, is it April? April 21st. All right, so we're finally getting into the lumbar spine. So yeah, here we go. So it's made up of five lumbar vertebrae. They're labeled L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. Found between, of course, the thoracic spine and the sacrum. Has its own set of muscles and ligaments, vessels, neural structures. Muscles and ligaments, fairly similar to those of the thoracic and most of the cervical spine. Vessels the same. Neural structures are a little different. Our neural structures, as you recall, we talked about how the spinal cord ends at the level of the L1 disc in that vicinity as the what? Good conus medullaris. But then the nerve roots have to keep going down to leave their neural foramen, so they come out of that conus medullaris, and some of them are very, very long. Which one's the longest? Oh, that's a good question. Of members of the quadriquina, who's the longest? Good, CX1, first and only coccygeal nerve root. It goes all the way down to the, to the sacral hiatus. All right, uh, let's see. Unlike the rest of the spine, it has traversing root. We said that, they hang in a thecal sac. Yeah, got that slide covered. Kind of some fun facts. Uh, it is the number one area for the development of chronic pain. More pain, cervical is number two. Uh, but yeah, so chronic pain, by the way, is defined as greater than three months in duration, according to the American Spine Society. Some, some experts prefer six months. I actually prefer six months as well. It's really chronic if you've had pain for six months. About 80% of humans develop significant low back pain, which takes them out of work for uh three or more days. There are many definitions to that, but it's a huge problem. That's where you got the weight of your trunk going down, the weight of your head, and the weight of gravity all pushing down on the disc and the facets and the sacroiliac joint. Here's a good fact. 20% of people who suffer a severe, acute, disabling attack of low back pain, and I mean a bad one, so you're down on the couch, you can't get up, they don't recover. That's a huge number. I mean, they recover, but they're kind of in the club, so to speak. They're likely for the pain to return at some point every, maybe once a year, every other year, maybe once every couple months, depending on how active they are. The economic costs are out, just outrageous. Back in 1996, it was 12 million. It's estimated to be about 20 million uh, at this in 2020 right now. It's huge. So it's a big problem. This is what keeps us in business, right? So many people have low back pain. Another thing to understand is mechanical low back pain. What does that mean? That's what we're going to treat mainly mechanical pain that arises from a disc tear or an injury to the facet joint or the zygapothecial joint. But it could be from bone or meninges, compression fracture, how much we can do about compression fractures or meningitis or other things. Most common causes of back pain, this must be the third or fourth time I've told you this, uh, annular tear, a rip through the disc, number one cause. Uh, zygapothecial joint is number two. Facet joint is number three. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, annular tear, number one. Zygapothecial joints, number two. Sacroiliac joints, number three. We said we're at about 5-8%, certainly not 50%, and certainly not 20% of people with chronic pain. Got to be careful of the research out there. The lumbar spine has a lordotic curve or a C-shape. The posterior portion is concave. And you need this curve is important for normal biomechanics. And if you don't have a normal lordotic curve, your axial load gets screwed up. Instead of being transmitted through the nucleus propulsus, it's transmitted uh, through the 
facet joints in the pars intraarticularis, and you'll see all sorts of problems because of this, potential problems. Um, you could say that the axial load is normally transmitted through the anterior column of the posterior common, which are the articular pillars in the zygopotheseal joints. They take load, but not they're not designed to take full load. The nucleus propulsus is. Here's a side view or sagittal view of or lateral view, whichever you want, of the lumbar spine. We've looked at this before. You can see the thecal sac here, how it ends at S2, phylum terminale interna, phylum terminale externa, cauticoina, the nerve roots, traversing roots have been removed. Anyway, you can see the curve here. So that's nice. That's the lumbar spine, bottom four bones between the thoracic and the sacrum. And here's the concept of these columns. So the anterior column is the weight going right through the nucleus propulsus. Posterior column, there's two of them, a right and left. They go right through the zygopotheseal joints. Right. What about screwed up, screwed up biomechanics? How can that result in chronic pain? Or what, what are the conditions that can screw up the biomechanics. Surprisingly, an annular tear. Let's take a minute to think, how in the world can an annular tear screw up your biomechanics? Let's go back to this picture. Let's see, did I turn on my drawing tools? Oh, yes, I did. So we all know that this is the nucleus propulsus, right? Nucleus propulsus. This is the annulus fibrosus. This is the intervertebral disc. What's not drawn here, let's see, I guess we can do them in pink. We have nerve roots that go right, kind of coming out of the plane of the page through that IVF. Kind of drew it so, just to show you the obliqueness of it. Uh, so what can happen, I think I've, have I talked about this? The lamellae, I don't, I'm not gonna draw the lamellae, but you can get a rip through the back of the disc, and then that green stuff can start to We'll make it red, it can come out. And that's an annular tear. And remember, there are nerves, sinovertebral nerves, which live in the back of the disc. They can get inflamed, uh, especially if the d d disc is degenerated and you have cytokines, you can inflame uh, these nerve roots and that can cause back pain and referred leg pain. The chemicals can actually leak out of the back of the disc and they can start to soak into the nerve root. And then they, therefore, they can inflame the nerve root as well. And you can, and we haven't even talked about a disc herniation. This is just an annular tear. Uh, and you can get a chemically induced radiculopathy because of this sort of situation. Now, what else does it do? Well, if you do, if you get that tear, let's see, let's make it. <clears throat> If you do get this tear through the disc, the research has shown over and over that the, the axial load, the key of axial load, now goes right to the back of the vertebral body. Uh, and right, right over the place you don't want it. You don't want it over this tear. And then it overloads these facet joints. The facet joints start doing too much work. So in the long term, you can wear out these joints and cause problems for set joint syndrome, as well as irritate the tear uh, just from a rip of that disc. Those annular tears can be significant. Strange thing is, and some people can have them and they don't have any problem with it. And we'll talk about the theories of that. Maybe have, uh, did I talk about that in embryology? Uh, but yeah. All right, so full thickness annular tear. Uh, scoliosis can definitely impart uneven weight loading. Some facets get way overloaded. Some facets have an easy life, and you can wear out those joints that are overloaded. Hyperlordosis will jam the facet joints and wear them out. Uh, so by the way, scoliosis is often associated with hypolordosis. That's a curve that's too straight. Degenerative disc disease, 
The annular tear also leads to degenerative disc disease and your disc can start shrinking in height. That can cause all sorts of trouble as well, including buckling, buckling ligamentum flavum and causing stenosis. And of course, any unevenness calls uh, zygopothecial joint. Or maybe you just hurt your, you, you jam a joint, you get hyperextension injury or twisting injury, and you injure that joint. Uh, and that can start to degenerate the joint and eventually mess up biomechanics. Okay, let's go over the basic parts. I think we've, have we done this? <clears throat> or maybe this is today's lab. I know we did a little basic overview a couple weeks ago, but we're going to get a little deeper into it now. Lumbar vertebrae is made up of two parts, a vertebral body and a vertebral arch. And there are no atypical vertebrae. They're all the same. There's no real weird ones like the atlas and axis we'll talk about in the cervical spine. And L5 is much wider and much more rugged and sturdy than L1. It's more like a thoracic vertebrae. So they get wider and more sturdy as you descend from L1 to L2. Right, here they are. So there's L1, L2, L3. They're getting bigger and bigger, and then L5 is massive. Anybody notice anything abnormal here? We've talked about this. My students should pick this up, hopefully, if you've been watching these things. Yeah, let's do, what color should we do? How about pink? Transverse process. These are all overhead views. They're like airplane wings sticking straight out. How's those L5 look? Oh, now you see the problem. These are spatulated transverse processes. Normally they're not like this. So the author really shouldn't have used this. Uh, about 5 to 7% of the population has these. And they've taken on characteristics of S1. So therefore this is called sacralization of L5. Or you could call it a transitional segment is related to chronic pain as we've talked about before. All right, let's go over the parts. You can pause this and test your knowledge. This is a really nice vertebrae. Okay, let's go through them. Start with the easy ones. Good, transverse process. All of this, not the whole though. Vertebral body, this thing, that little ridge of bone and kind of Circularly, and they're making up a circumference here of the, or on the periphery of the vertebral body. There's one on the bottom. It's called the ring apothesis. That's where your growth occurs, vertical growth. Uh, the bone, the vertebrae, grows upward through this system right here. Uh, what else we got? Basi vertebral foramen, or Hans venus cleft, as it appears on radiograph. The, your basic vertebral artery vein and nerves go in there because this is living tissue, the vertebral body, and you got to have nerves supplying it. And yeah, they can, and they do. What else we got? How about this thing coming out of the plane of the page? Good, spinous process, all of this. How about forming the kind of the roof of the vertebral canal here? Good. Two lamina on each side. How about this thing? Got to get out my drawing tools for this. How about this whole thing? I want one word because there's we can break down the parts in a little bit. What's this whole thing called? Some authors don't call it this. Radiologists tend to call it this because it's it's like a pillar of bone. You got your this is your lateral column. The weight is going right through this thing. So that's called the articular pillar. Articular pillar. Okay, what else we got? What about this right here? All right. Well, yeah. If you said, if you said, art superior articular process, you are correct. I mean, from this angle, superior articular process would be all of this. But really, I mean, this is this is really articular cartilage, right? There's a pad of articular cartilage. Now it's kind of gone in this bone, but this is the facet of the superior articular process or the superior articular facet. 
So in lab, if, I, if we're back in lab, by the time midterms come, if I stick number four here, call it the facet of the superior articular process. Right? <clears throat> the pars interarticularis doesn't look like it's in the middle from this view, but it's typically right about here underneath that lamina. It's not really well seen from this P to A view. And then, so the inferior articular process, we have lamina <clears throat> coming down like this. Then this would all be inferior articular process here. And notice that the facet, you can see it on the superior articular process from a PA view, but you can't. It's on the other side. So if I put number 5, that would be inferior articular process. Very good with that. Do we get all the hard stuff? Yeah, we got the hard stuff. Now there's some weird stuff. So we have these bumps right here. And you don't, often you don't see these. You try to palpate these. I think it's pretty rare. I don't think I've ever palpated one. Uh, but they're, because they're so deep, they're underneath the rector spiny muscle. But they're pretty big in this specimen. They can get fairly big occasionally. They can almost look like tumors on your, on radiograph sometime. Uh, those are called mammillary processes. Mammillary processes. Okay. Accessory processes right here. And these are attachments for muscles and ligaments, which we'll get into later, but accessory processes. I think I got everything. Of course, the neuroforamen would be this hole here, and then it would come out down here, part of the vertebral canal, or sorry, vertebral foramen. Did I say neuroforamen? I don't want you to really say that. It's an AKA, but it's better to say vertebral foramen. Okay, we're good. All right, there's a little quiz. Take the quiz. I think this is in lab, one of the labs. Uh, if not, it's good practice because it might be in the lab. I could put this exact drawing on the lab, a uh, uh, midterm if we do, uh, if I have to do it by computer. There's the answers. Accessory processes there. How about this view? What view is this? Well, this is a sagittal view or a lateral view. And we have the transverse process coming out of the plane of the page, kind of looking right at us, right? And then what do we have right here? I don't see a facet. I see a facet here. See how smooth that is? So this is the superior articular process. Mammillary, little mammillary process right there. Mammillary process of the superior articular process. And then facet of the inferior articular process. Pars would be right in here. The transverse process is kind of blocking it. But it would be right under here. Uh, we have this thickest part of the bone, strongest part of the bone. It's the pedicle. Spinous, spinous. Lamina would be about here. Right? And uh, this would be the superior bony vertebral end plate. I don't think I listed those. Inferior bony vertebral end plate. Maybe I did. Vertebral body. Inferior vertebral notch. Right? That makes up part of the neural foramen. Inferior vertebral notch. Superior vertebral notch would be right here, more prominent. Superior vertebral notch. Got it? Very important stuff. We'll get deeper into that uh, in a little bit. Yeah, I didn't label those end plates, but those are the bony. There's cartilaginous end plates and bony end plates. You can add that to your picture. All right. Let's talk a little bit more now about the articular pillars. Uh, there are two columns of bone, as we've kind of talked about them already. The term usually applies to the cervical spine in our board books, but radiologists tend to use that term as well. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. The articular pillars are made up of three things. That'd be a good question, wouldn't it? Board-style question, which only has four choices, multiple-choice answers. Uh, blank is not a member of the articular pillar. And then I could list superior articular process. Oh, yeah, that is. 
inferior articular process. Oh, yeah, that is. Pars intraarticularis. Yeah, that is. Next answer's got to be false. And I could say, oh, the lamina, how about? All right, so here's a 3D C CT scan. I kind of drew this for you before. When I lecture in class, I'm not able to draw like this, so it's kind of nice for me to be able to draw. Uh, but let's go to a real where the term came from. So this is a cut, not through the very center of the spine. We're looking from the side. This is a sagittal or a lateral view. It's, it's a parasagittal view. It's not a cut right through the middle. Um, but here you can see the part. You can see the articular pillars quite nicely. So I can draw them. Here's the superior articular process right here. Okay, this next region, make it pink. This would be the center. This is the pars intraarticularis. And then let's make it green. And this is the inferior articular process. You got to know those words like the back of your hand. Those are your ABCs. You got to know those. Notice that the inferior articular process connects with the superior articular process of the bone below. And so together, the inferior articular process and the superior articular process, they make this. Yeah, that's the Z joint. That's the zygapotheceal joint. Okay, everybody good? Why would you order a CT? Would you ever order a CT in your practice? Yeah, you're treating a, especially a gymnast or football player with chronic back pain. You take x-rays, you don't see anything wrong. And uh, yeah, you got to figure if four weeks goes by, they can't go back to sport, and they're still having pain, your treatment's not working. You need to work this up further. You can suspect spondylolis lysis. You can suspect a pars fracture. So how do these pars intraarticulari look? They look really good. I don't see any fractures through there, right? Fractures like a you'd see like a black line. It's usually about that big through there. I don't see any of that. I see white stress, extra bones taking this patient's taking some stress on his pars. They look good. I also you need to also look at the back corners here. We'll talk about this more, but I might as well show you now. Got to look at these back corners to make sure these bones are in alignment. Make sure all the ligaments are in line. Let's see, I can also draw a line. It should be relatively smooth because sometimes these bones stick way out like this. That's called the spondylolisthesis, and we'll look at that actually a little bit today. Right, but yeah, these pars looks good, but let's, oh, I blew it up, didn't I? Okay. What's inside this? Well, that's a real joint. It's a diarthroidal joint. That's filled with synovial fluid. And that's what, I mean, That's that keeps us in business facet joint injuries, we're pretty good at fixing those things, especially when they get locked up and stuck. You'll learn about that as you go through the program. Let's do a case study. Let's make sure I turned on my recorder. Just in case. Yep. Okay, just in case Camtasia fails me. A 35-year-old comes in with chronic back pain, started after a high school wrestling match, had back pain on and off kind of in the club, so to speak. Went to college on a wrestling scholarship, so most of the time he did pretty good, but once a year it would flare up. Neurological exam was normal. Uh, when you bent him back, no, he's acute now, he's in your office. He's in pain, but when you tried to bend him backwards, it was very painful. So x-rays were taken. Uh, they were negative. You treated him for four weeks. He didn't get better. And so the next step is to order something called a CT scan. You can't always see cracks in the pars. Cracks in the pars, intraarticularis, are called spondylolysis. Right? So you can't always see spondylolysis 
on x-ray. So we ordered a CT scan. So what do you think? My first quarter students, I bet some of them you guys can already see it just with the information I've given you. Well, let's look at, this is S1 down here, L5, L4. Let's look at L4 PARS, superior articular process, inferior articular process, nice, thick, juicy, healthy PARS. How about this one? Oh, yeah, I bet you every single one of you can see that. That's a fractured PARS. And in fact, if we, if we drew the lines, the dots, which you can see much better on CT than x-ray, because x-ray is like getting run over by a steamroller. Everything's flat. But you can see there's definitely a little bit of slip. If I drew a line, whoops, I kind of screwed up my line, didn't I? If I drew a line, let me see if I could do it a little better. If I drew a line straight down, you can see it's actually slipped about 25% from this the, this quick crude drawing. So if it's within 25%, it's called a grade 1 spondylolisthesis. We'll see some better pictures of that. All right, awesome. So yeah, there's your, you can read about it if you, when you're studying for the test. If you forget what I said, there, there it is to help you. Okay, the lumbar curve, let's go back to what's considered a secondary or compensatory curve, just like the cervical spine. Uh, it is detected in vivo, so while the embryo is still walking, or while the fetus is still uh, inside mom's tummy, it, you actually do have a little bit of a curve. Uh, but when the child starts crawling, you develop the cervical curve, because the child has to lift up his head. But when you start walking, that's when the child develops the lumbar curve. So when they start walking, 9 to 18 months. So, and again, super important for normal bio, biomechanics. Normally extends from T12 to L5S1. More pronounced in females than males. Lordosis is the deepest at between L3 and S1. What creates the curve? Well, the vertebral bodies, vertebral bodies are actually wedged. If I, if the lumbar curve is like this, the lumbar vertebrae are actually a little bit bigger in the back than they are in the anterior. I'm exaggerating it there, but there's a spinous process. Uh, so that helps, um, that helps form the curve. I'm sorry, I screwed that up, didn't I? They're taller anteriorly. Let me do that again. So if here's the curve. So to make the curve, it's actually a little bit bigger anteriorly. I'll exaggerate it. Then posteriorly. Right? And that would, if I drew another one. You see how that goes? So... This distance here, the vertical height is taller anteriorly than posteriorly, and that's what helps cause this. Uh, and then you have the tension of the erector spiny muscles I'm back here pulling down on everything. So that helps form the lumbar curve. Okay, some more fun facts. So the lordosis, what does that mean? The lordosis increases. Well, it means the lordosis gets greater or more pronounced uh, when you are sitting compared to laying down. Or so even worse, standing, you have the greatest lordosis. And the, that standing actually starts to jam the facets together. People with facet syndrome, they, don't, they have trouble standing uh, be, because of that phenomenon. So... Lordosis, therefore, from standing, uh, it decreases during flexion and increases during extension. That's another fun fact there. So when you bend forward, it takes away that lordosis. When you bend backwards, it accentuates, that makes sense, the lordosis. And again, in general, facet patients, patients with zygopathosial joint problems, they don't do well standing. They have trouble standing. You can ask them to differentiate between an annular tear 
and facet joint syndrome, one, and it doesn't always work. There's always exceptions, but most of the time, the patients with facet problems, they have trouble standing. Like ask them, you know, do you travel? Do you have to stand in the uh, the security checkpoints? Does that, go, oh yeah, I hate standing. I'd much rather be sitting or walking around. It's probably a facet joint patient. And then just the opposite, when you sit, it loads the disc. The disc gets pressurized, and those patients with tears in their disc, they cannot stand sitting. Of course, a really acute disc, annular tear, they can't sit or stand or do anything. They're just miserable. But usually sitting is the worst. And let's see, what is the function of the lordosis? So it it's important for absorbing and dissipating the loads of the spine. So it handles the weight of the trunk and the head. And your activities of daily living are all transmitted uh, through the lordosis, through this nucleus propulsus. And normal biomechanics is super important. In fact, with normal biomechanics, as we said, the nucleus propulsus of the anterior column, that's the pivot point. And that's where most spinal motions occur. What are the spinal motions? We'll do this when we do biomechanics. But flexion, extension, right and left lateral bending, right and left rotation. We're going to get into the sagittal, anterior sagittal translation and all that stuff too when the time comes. Here's a just a cartoon of the nucleus propulsus. I mean, it's water. It's about 80% water because of the proteoglycans. Did we talk about those yet? I don't think we did, but we will talk about the proteoglycans, how they grab water, 80% water. And then the annulus fibrosis is made up uh, by these rings, kind of like the rings of a tire. And in reality, let's see, in reality, these rings actually go through the vertebral end plate. So they completely surround the disc because there's a vertebral end plate we haven't talked about. Oh, it's not this big, but I exaggerate it. Um, but yeah, it's completely surrounded. So therefore, when you push down on water, water's incompressible. It tries to escape, but it can't. It becomes rock hard. It almost acts like a ball bearing here, and that's where your that's where your joint is. That's where you can pivot from. All right, that's a ball bearing X is a pivot point. Great. And then the Z joints back here, the facet joints, they don't take that much of the load, the posterior columns. So sometimes if the bones, you young people, the bones are strong, no problems usually. Older people start to lose calcium. It's a little more complicated than just calcium, but they... The strength of the bone decreases. You can see that on x-ray. Uh, osteoporosis, osteosclerosis, other diseases. Usually osteoporosis can cause the bones to get really thin. And yeah, if your bones are really thin and you have a fall, an actually load fall, especially if you're bent forward a little bit, you can have a fracture. The bones can fracture because they're not strong. The facets can fracture as well. So these axial load compression forces can be trouble. Even young people, if you overload, if you put 1,500 pounds on your back, you probably end up with a compression fracture. So here's a 48-year-old male comes in the, your clinic, back pain. Uh, he was in the emergency room a couple weeks ago, still having back pain, and you throw up his CT. Why take x-rays if he just had a CT? And throw up the CT, and what do you see? Well, remember the bones are usually pretty square. It's a typical bone. Oh yeah, some of you see it. See it's all jagged here. There's a lucent line right here. So that's a compression fracture, right? This would be L2, L1. So got himself a compression fracture with a little fragment here almost broken loose. So. Pretty bad compression fracture. All right, hyperlordosis and its sequelae. What are the problems with hyperlordosis? There's a nice hyperlordosis, right? You see these in gymnasts. They extend their back to kind of magnify. Uh, but it's called a sway back sometimes. That's a hyperlordosis. 
And yeah, if you have hyperlordosis, you're not having normal biomechanics and you're putting an awful lot of load on the pars interarticularis and the facet joints, not to mention a shear force on the disc. I guess I could have added shear force to the disc because people are, uh, with these problems, they're prone to, they're, they're more likely to become a member of the low back pain club, right? So Z joints are overloaded. It jams the inferior articular process into the lamina, which stresses the pars. You can fracture the pars from that. It overloads the disc. It puts a shear force on the disc, which encourages it to rip. It overloads the SI joints, too. So if you have a hyperlordosis, you may become a club member. Uh, so just a kind of a cartoon, a PA view. Here's the inferior articular process. And picture the spine bending backwards. These joints jam right into the lamina and close to the pars. Uh, so when you're doing extension like gymnastics or football or cricket, it's the worst of all the sports. Is We don't do that in this country, but the pitch, uh, I guess it's called the pitcher who plays cricket, they really extend their back suddenly and it jams uh, the lamina here and it can break the pars after doing that time and time and time again. Uh, so we already said risk factor for spondylolisthesis. The jamming of our inferior, inferior articular processes increases the chance for breaking the pars. We said breaking the pars like we saw already. That is called a spondylolysis. And if the brake becomes unstable and the vertebral body slips forward, then you have a spondylolisthesis. So technically you have a spondylolytic spondylolisthesis. But that's not always the case. Fracture of the pars is not the only thing that can cause a slip of the vertebrae forward. How do you tell if someone's hyperlordotic? You're going to learn this again, I think, as you go through the program. Uh, but in case you don't, here it is, Ferguson's line. Uh, so really easy to do. You just take the L3 vertebrae on a lateral or sagittal x-ray and put dots at the corners and then connect the dots and find the center of the vertebral body and drop a straight vertical line down per perpendicular to the edge of the plane. Oh, software has it all, all the soft free software, you, the DICOM viewing software, you can do this really easily. And then normally, if you have a normal lordotic curve, this red line should go right through the anterior portion of S1 here, the body of S1. If it's more than 10 millimeters in front of this, you got yourself a biomechanical problem. You have biomechanical instability, and you have overloading L5 and S4, the discs, overloading the pars, and overloading the facets. Now, while I take a sip of water, tell me what's the matter with this x-ray. We haven't looked too much at x-ray. We've kind of started with CT. I think CT is actually easier to view. How good? Some of you saw it. Remember I put the little dots at the co back corners of the bones? What if I did that here? So there's one here. There's one here. Those aren't too bad. Something's funky here, right? This one's way up here. This one's here. And this one's way here. So this is almost another grade 1, almost a grade 2 spondylolisthesis. And it looks like the pars is fractured here. So it looks like a spondylolytic spondylolisthesis. All right, so everything I said already, the Ferguson's line or the gravity line should, f uh, if it is a little bit in four, maybe maybe it's only like about here, that's okay. It might be a little instability, but the rule is once it's 10 millimeters in front of the, the very front of the sacrum, that sacral promontory, you're officially unstable and you're at risk for this sort of thing, fracture of the pars. You can almost see the pars. This is a bilateral fracture because I can see both pars. Here's the pars up here, both pars. Remember x-rays like you got squished flat by a steamroller? Yeah, the disc space is also shot. So the disc has got degenerative disc disease there. And yeah. So these patients, when Ferguson's line is this far forward, they always have hyperlordosis.
Okay, the sequelae of anterior weight bearing. Uh, what well, we talked about it increased shear force on the disc and the pars, uh, overloads the facets, the pars. Yeah, and you can cause disease of these things. In fact, here are here are the diseases that can be called caused um, by this. All right, spondylolysis, spondylolisthesis, degenerative disc disease, annular tears, disc herniations, facet syndromes from overload, SI joint problems. So, yeah, people don't always have problems, but you're sure setting yourself up for a problem if you have a hyperlordosis. What about another way to tell if someone's hyperlordotic? Well, we met Ferguson's line. How about Ferguson's angle? So here's the lumbosacral angle, and it's really simple. You draw a line parallel to the bottom of the film or bottom of the earth or whatever you want, and then you draw a line right down the sacral base. Put two dots here and draw a line straight like that and measure that angle, which should be 35, 45 degrees. I think average is around 42, if I remember. It should definitely not be up in the 50s. So we'll look at the numbers here in a second. But that's called Ferguson's angle or the lumbosacral angle. Is there another AK? No, those are the 10 Ks. Uh, there, that is a little controversial, but normally it's about 42 degrees. And anecdotally, and it doesn't, some people have really steep sacral base angles and they don't have pain, at least at the time of the study. But there's no lifetime studies. I have a feeling most of these people are going to have more trouble than usual with their back as they get into old age. So the studies are like snapshots, right? They can't. Very few studies follow people for 20, 30 years. Um, but anecdotally, once the lumbosacral angle gets over about 50 degrees, your patient is apt to be or will soon be or will eventually be in the kind of bad back pain club. Uh, and it causes hyperlordosis. And then all those those risk factors. Here's some did I do this? I think I put this together in a study on sacral base angles, and average was about 42 degrees. Uh, so the, what's the sequelae of increased lumbosacral angle? Well, it's the exactly the same sequelae as that of an anterior Ferguson's line. Same stuff. It overloads the C-joint, posterior arch, the lamina, you can have pars fractures, you can rip your inner vertebral disc from the shear force. Exactly the same thing uh, I said. Same causes of low back pain uh, as for an anterior Ferguson's line as well. All right, here's a 72 year old, comes in with low back pain. What do you think of him? Oh, it's kind of, I put the lines in there. But he's got a slip as well. Well, actually, he's not very good. So the back of the bones right here, he's got about a grade almost a grade two spondylo here. Quite a bit of slip, right? I guess, remember you guys are first quarter, so I'll have to draw these. You can't hallucinate them. You'll, your eyes will learn to kind of hallucinate things in. Probably looks about like that. Even I can't see it through there. Uh, but it's definitely slipped forward at least a grade one. But the point is here, look at Ferguson's angle. It's 50.2 degrees in this patient of mine. All right, how about this, another guy? Guy ended up having a very successful fusion uh, following failed all conservative care, unable to work, got to do something, right? Unstable spondylolisthesis. His was 55 degrees. And as far as I know, he's still doing good. That's definitely a grade two. We'll show you how to grade these in a minute. Uh, so... Spondylolisthesis, we said this already, means there's a slip of the inferior vertebral body on the adjacent inferior vertebral body. May not be symptomatic. Some people can go their whole lives like this and not have any trouble. The trouble is once it gets lit up by an injury like an axial low, the fall in the butt, can be really tough to fix these, much tougher than normal people with a normal spine. Uh, and Another thing you need to, if you have a patient who comes in with a chronic spondylolisthesis, you have to understand, is, is it unstable or not? To this day, I mean, so much of my uh, my job is to order simple flexion extensions films because people forget to do it, and that's a big factor, especially for surgeons. 
Because when you bend forward, your bones should stay in place. They shouldn't slip way forward or slip way backwards. Uh, but sometimes they do. And if, if you go over 3.5 millimeters, you're officially unstable. Okay? In fact, that's a rateable disability in AMA guides. Uh, anything greater or equal to 3.5 millimeters of slip between flexion and extension, that's a rateable disability. Even if you have 2 millimeters of slip, there's a, the, it could be micro-irritating the parse fracture or the inflamed Z-joints or the disc, the annular tear. Uh, so it's significant. I found it to be significant. Okay, here's simple flexion extension I ordered a couple years ago. And so here he's bending forward. You can see this is a side view of him bending forward. And we look kind of here at the at the back of the bones. All right, they look pretty good in place. All right, maybe forward a tiny bit. But when we bend them back, look what happens. Try to draw the same line. And you would do this segment by segment. But you see how we got a stair step here? There's the sacral canal right there. So that's the back of the vertebral body. So yeah, we got a spondylo. Uh, but it's not that, it wasn't that evident in the neutral uh, and the flexion. But when he extends, this, body, this bone shoots out. I think I measured it here. I don't think it's quite significant, though. It measured out about three millimeters. So kind of borderline. It's not officially unstable, but it's definitely unstable enough to be a source of pain because remember there's a there's a parse fracture right here right there's a fracture uh, and when you're especially if you're active you're bending and twisting and doing things the bones going back and forth and back and forth and it's irritating this uh, which is probably already inflamed and maybe the facet joint there's a facet joints might be irritated as well because they're not designed to go back and forth and back and forth uh, so finding stability is quite important. Let's do a case. 52-year-old male presents with chronic low back pain, bilateral radicular pain, left greater than right, following work comp injury, failed conservative care, neurological evaluation, finds sensory loss in the L4 and L5 dermatones on the left. So he's got radiculopathy is the diagnosis now that you have positive neurological findings associated with leg pain. You can make the diagnosis of radiculopathy. And yeah, so the insurance company doctor said, oh, the case is closed. He's not a surgical candidate. And then he cited some research. I think it was actually a nurse, nurse review person. He said, oh, here's some research. Spondylolisthesis are often asymptomatic, so the case is closed. But I simply dug through the records and there was no flexion extension. How do you know if the guy's unstable? And so we ordered. The patient had to pay for him out of his own pocket. Work comp denied it. So we ordered flexion extension x-rays. And lo and behold, here is extension. And this would have been worse if he could have really extended, but he couldn't extend very much because of his back pain. So the slip measures 6.2 millimeters. When we bent him forward, look what happened to that bone slid way out to 11.76 millimeters. Uh, and you do the math, 11.76 minus the 7.6, we got five millimeters of sagittal translational motional instability. Or you could just say translational instability. That's a rateable disability for one. And for two, it doesn't mean that there might be, he might benefit from a inner body fusion to stop all that darn motion. And in fact, that's exactly after some fighting, everything I said right there. Uh, after some fighting and legal battle, he finally got to have an anterior lumbar interbody fusion. That's the Tiger Woods fusion. Uh, and he did real well. He was, last time I talked to him, he was 18% disabled, which is great. Most, the average interbody fusion is about a 25% disability. Uh, so... Yeah, so I mean, it's it's not there. There still is hope. Just because you can't treat someone with conservative care, it doesn't mean that more aggressive care can't can't fix them. Look at Tiger Woods. I mean, all those internet people hating fusion. And I'm a chiropractor. I have a failed surgery, so I'm I mean, I'm super conservative. 
Uh, my mission in life is to educate healthcare providers on when's a good time to have surgery and when's not a good time to have surgery. Because my school, they did a crappy job. We know we knew nothing about surgery. No, not nothing about it. And so I think it's a good idea, especially where primary health, we're quarterbacks of the patient's health care. Uh, we need to be spine extras. We need to know about some basics about fusion, inner body fusion, and discectomy, and decompression surgeries for stenosis. We should know that stuff. Okay, that's enough. I'm ranting. Um, how do you make the diagnosis? Well, you first you start out with a A to P and lateral view. And you, if you suspect spondylolysis, you go to oblique radiographs. I won't get into those now, but you'll see on those uh, as you move through the program. They're going to give you a pretty good shot of the pars intraarticularis. Sometimes you can't see them, though. Maybe the image quality was bad, or you, they just don't show up. And CT scan, as I've already showed you, can see them really, really easily. Even on CT, though, if, the, if it's like a hairline fracture, you can't see it. The ultimate is a, um, you can do scintigra or scintigraphy or a bone scan. Sometimes you have to go to bone scan to really see them. So how are they graded? How do you rate? I said grade one, grade two. How does that, what's the story with that? So might as well learn this now and you'll get this, uh, you'll get this as you go. But the Maillardine system is what's always used. And here's the Maillardine system. You measure the posterior corners of the vertebral bodies involved, and you see how far the slip is. If it slipped from 1% to 25%, that's a grade 1. Anything over, that should be 26. Anything over 25% is grade 2. Anything over 50%, like 51%, is a grade 3. I'm going to make a note to fix that slide here. Slide 313 fix. Um, if it slips off the cliff, you got yourself, it's called a spondylopetosis. You shouldn't call it a grade 5 uh, spondylo. Hey, here's the Maillardian system. Uh, so grade 1 would be if the, if the bone went like this, still be a grade. I just draw part of the bone still be a grade 1. So anything between here and here, 25%, that's a grade 1. Once you get to a 26% between here and here, that's a grade 2. Between 51 and 75, grade 3. And then between 75 and 100%, grade 4, if it slips off the cliff like some of these have, that's a spondylopetosis. Okay, that's the Meyardian system. You need to know that. That needs to be part of your ABCs. It's very simple. You you need to get that into your brains. Don't forget that. I guarantee you questions coming from that for me. All right, there's another little uh, diagram of it. Same thing. What causes a spondylolisthesis? I actually have a YouTube video. It's a couple years, maybe three or four years old that really goes into it, all the, the different causes. You have to just scroll down my page or or Google spondylolisthesis Gillard and it'll pop up, I'm sure. Um, but there's six types. We won't get into all those for first quarter, but you should know the most common is those fractures we've been talking about. That's called the isthmic spondylolisthesis. That's not the only type, though. I think you should know the second most common as well. That's called the degenerative spondylolisthesis. So you're going to be seen, because the baby boomers, you're going to be treating a lot more older people than I treated. They're going to have these degenerative spondylolisthesis. There's no fracture involved with this thing. It's just a slip of the facets. The Z joints or facet joints get so degenerated, they slip and they let the bone, the top bone, slide forward on the bottom. Let's check this case out. This is a complicated one. 45-year-old female presents with chronic low back pain and severe right radicular pain. What's that mean, radicular pain? Sciatic is kind of the layman term for it. Uh, but that means that's the pain. They have pain radiating down their leg, and it's kind of in one or two dermatone pattern. It's not their whole leg, It's which is like a neuropathic type pain. 
Uh, but it means that it's it's in a specific region in the leg. Don't call it radiculopathy, right? That's my pet peeve. Radiculopathy is a diagnosis. It means that you've done a neurological evaluation and you found something wrong, like decreased sensation in the S1 dermatome or weakness in the L5 myotome. Once you find that, you can say the patient has radicular pain uh, with and has radiculopathy, which tells me that you've done a neurological examination that's positive. Um, okay, so chronic hand joint pain as well. What, what the heck was I trying to say? Chronic low back pain, severe radicular pain. I don't know what I was saying, hand joint pain as well. Oh, hand, yeah. So metacarpal joint pain and phalanges. So I remember this case now. Uh, so they also have the inability to walk. This has got some great stuff in it, this case. Have the inability to walk for more than two blocks because their legs get hot, tired, and they cramp. That's got a word, and we'll talk about that more in fifth quarter. It's called intermittent claudication. Could be vascular, could be neurogenic. It could be VIC. Very important. We'll get these fifth quarter. VIC versus NIC. Intermittent claudication is the same. That means you go for a walk and you have your legs don't work anymore. They can be heavy like you're walking in cement, and they can hurt too. Usually I, the complaint I hear the most is they're like walking in cement and they feel tired and crampy, and they just don't seem to work very good. So neuro, we'll see. Well, this is, means there's a vascular problem. That means there's usually they have pad peripheral artery disease and their abdominal aorta is clogged up. And when they walk, their muscles exercise, and they can't feed the muscles enough oxygen because they can't get blood down there fast enough. So the muscles kind of peter out and cramp up. And neurogenic claudication is stenosis. The thecal sac is squished uh, by usually ligamentum flavum hypertrophy, disc bulging, and maybe a degenerative spondylolisthesis. Boy, I'm really going on uh, tangents today, aren't I? I haven't even been watching my time. I'm probably getting, where'd we start? We started on slide 255, so that's like 55. We can go a little bit more. Um, yeah, so anyway, here's the case. So very stiff in the morning. They got some hand joint pain and stiffness in the morning. Trouble walking. Failed all conservative care comes to you. Uh, what do you do? Radiographs show a spondylolisthesis. But you want to investigate this radicular pain, so you order an MRI. So let's see what we see here. And before, we haven't looked at that many MRIs. Here's a bird's eye view uh, of a cut going right through the L5 disc. So everything above L5, we've ta erased their whole body. So like cutting a tree with a chainsaw, we're looking at the rings of the trunk right here. So we can see the nucleus propulsus is white in here. Uh, you can't see the lamellae, but you can see the dark type 1 collagen here making up this strong annulus fibrosis the back of the disc at l5 is normally not concave but it kind of like a football shape it looks great ligamentum flavum is pretty good here maybe a touch thick uh, but not i mean that's pretty much normal you can see there's i think we're getting some shadow here there's the thickness of ligamentum flavum right there and unusually large thecal sac usually they're not this big here but thecal sac white. This is a T2 weighted MRI, so it's filled with synovial fluid, which glows bright white on T2 imaging. Neuroframen are huge, right? There's the L5 exiting root, probably dorsal root ganglia. There's the S1 traversing nerve root. A little strange because that should already be out. Usually it's already butted out, but it's not in this case. The point I want you to watch here, look at how big the thecal sac is. The epidural fat, you can just see a little fat back here is also white in color. So now let's see this patient. What do you think of that? Holy smokes. And I'll tell you right now, this is fat. That's epidural fat. Where's all the pretty... There's the nerve roots, the S1 roots, the S2, the S3, S4. Where's all the pretty nerve roots? Smashed up into a little ball. So no good. The 
There's the epidural venous plexus. I think I talked about the last lecture or somewhere I talked about. Maybe it was fifth quarter. Um, but yeah, it's crushed. So you go for a walk and your your nerves are going to exercise and make waste products that has to be drained away. Can't drain it away because your epidural venous plexus is crushed. So it drains away really slow and you start to get a backup of acid and waste products and oh my God, my legs are starting to hurt and not work good. And yeah, that's the deal. So what has caused this? Well, how's the ligament? Well, we haven't talked. We're going to talk about ligaments. I guess we'll do that. I'm kind of going off on tangents today, but ligamentum flavum is right here. Right? Way, way, way too thick. And it's pushing down in the thecal sac. The other weird thing that's going on. So look at the facet joint here. Right? It's pretty darn sagittal. And then this one is kind of curled around like this. So this facet is so straight and degenerated that it actually slipped. So if I can draw the inferior articular process, here's the superior articular process. Let's make that so oh, red. Here's the superior articular process back here. And that's being generous. So this entire L3, and this is the right side, the right, um, the right posterior or vertebral arch has slid forward and it's crushing this nerve here on the left. Uh, and then ligamentum flavin thickening. So the bottom line, the disc actually is bulging a little but not too bad, but the combination of those has smashed the porthecal sac into a little ball. So this, what I've just told you right here, that you'll take this the rest of your life, the rest of your chiropractic career, you will take this information I just gave you. So it's not wasted information. All right, so yeah. So everything I just said, there's how the, uh, the posterior arch slid forward. It caused what's called a degenerative spondylolisthesis. We talked already about neurogenic intermittent claudication. And on his MRI, ordered MRI, he had shiny corner sign. Okay, that's a sign of one of the, uh, that can be a sign of many things like psoriatic arthritis. That's one of the seronegative spondyl arthropathies that I made you learn already. And so, yeah, so we ordered some blood testing. Sure enough, he's HLB27 positive and uh, RF negative. Rheumatoid factor negative. And so on top of everything else, he had psoriatic arthritis. So, yeah. All right, I must be, that must be about time, right? I feel like I didn't, I always should start my watch, but I know it's been, do we want to keep going? That's probably enough, I think, for today. Let me check my slides. Don't want to crush you with too many slides. So 255, so that's like 50. That's like 70 some slides, right? Is that, let's just do a tiny, tiny bit and then we'll stop. I can do maybe a few more slides. We had a lot of pictures. Let's just go through these and we'll call it a day. I think you know these already anyway. Really nice images here. Uh, drawing. So this is an A to P view of the lumbar spine. We have an anterior longitudinal ligament. Okay. If you cut the pedicles, and take off the vertebral bodies and just leave the lamina, or this is the roof of the vertebral canal, uh, we can see ligamentum flavum right here. Two, There's two sets of ligamentum flavum, a left and a right. There's only one anterior longitudinal ligament. You can see the skinnier posterior longitudinal ligament on the back. There's only one of that. There's a intertransverse ligament, which Bognuk goes... Uh, tries to emphasize very strongly that it's really not, doesn't have good collagen organization. It's more like a membrane, and it actually extends all the way down here. When you're doing a, a, a fusion called a posterior lateral fusion, you can actually use this to pack morselized bone in between. Uh, you can use this ligament, and you can pack ground up bone here to help fuse the transverse processes. It's part of a procedure called the PLIF, posterior lateral fusion. Digressing again. Okay, from the side view, we got the nucleus propulsus, the disc, we have the anus fibrosis. You can see the lamellae faintly in there. 
we have, this is not correct though, they, they drew the vertebral end plates. The vertebral end plates don't go all the way back here. So that's one problem. They stop right there. The author messed that up. And what else can we see? Ligamentum flavum again. The capsule ligament isn't here, but I have a picture of that coming. There's the, there is the, okay, they messed this up too, didn't they? If this lumbar spine, we shouldn't see a spinal cord, right? These should be nerve roots because these are clearly lumbar vertebrae. These should be caught equina. These should be horse's tail, not a single cord. So that's messed up. Ligaments are nice though. Posterior longitudinal ligament, they kind of taper and wrap around to the side here, posterior lateral corner, so that's really nice. Two ligaments here, this is the inter, not intra, interspinous ligament. And then we have on the back side here, we have the supraspinous ligament. Right, I think I got all those. You can test your skills there. And posterior longitudinal ligament. Here's a nice view. There's a, what they do. They did like a mid-sagittal. This is a great way to show you a mid-sagittal cut on CT because here's the full vertebral body. But if you just cut right through the middle, you have the, you can see the vertebrae and the mid the disc uh, and yeah the pedicles. You would actually be cut right through the pedicles, won't you, on a middle cut? Because the pedicles are more lateral. See, there's a pedicle. You'd have to do a parasagittal cut. Uh, to see that. Ligamentum flavum, interspinous ligament, supraspinous ligament, um, yeah, posterior longitudinal ligament. Oh, I'm trying to say, why did I put this in here? Oh, for this right here. So the author drew in a nice capsule, facet joint capsule here. All right, okay, that's enough. Now let's, we'll call it a day before we, we're, now that I gave you the general ligaments, we're going to start digging into these things. So that's enough. All right, keep our fingers crossed. Camtasia, please don't lose this recording.